Welcome to Alpine Learning Group's Innovation in Autism series. This webinar, Working with Autism, is one in a series of free webinars presented throughout the month of April. At the close of this presentation, we will share a QR code to learn about the other presentations in this series. I'm Dr. Jamie Nequinzio, a behavior analyst and psychologist here at Alpine Learning Group. And for over 13 years, I've had the pleasure of working alongside a group of innovative and compassionate leaders in the field of autism. I'm happy we can share their expertise with you here today. I'm very excited to introduce Katrina Roberts, the director of Alpine's Adult and Transition Programs, and she will lead a panel presentation and discussion on employment. Katrina will introduce the topic as well as the panel members. Katrina, take it away. Thank you, Jamie, and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for this conversation on meaningful employment for individuals with autism. We have four panelists joining us today to share their various experiences on this topic, and we are so excited to hear from them all. During this hour, I will share some statistics and other information regarding employment and the reasons we are here today. In between topics presented, I will ask questions of our panelists on their thoughts and experiences within each of those areas. We will leave a few minutes at the end for your questions as well. I would first like to introduce our panelists who have joined us for this conversation today. Suzette Joseph is a parent of one of our Alpine students. Her daughter, Melanie, has been with Alpine since she was eight years old and is preparing for adult life after graduation from our program this June. Kathleen McCarthy is another parent of one of our Alpine students. Her son, Thomas, also a panelist today, recently joined us in our transition programs and has a variety of work experiences so far with and without Alpine support. And Thomas McCarthy, is a student in our transition programs. He is here today as he is a very hard worker and would like to share with you all about his variety of experiences and what he has been learning so far here at Alpine. Gary Lipman is the owner of Apple Spice Box Lunch Catering Company in Hackensack, New Jersey. Previously, Gary was a program director at a local community center where he taught life skills to young adults with disabilities. Today, he owns his own business and employs our students at his business. Thank you to all of our panelists for joining us today. We look forward to hearing from you and learning from each of your experiences. Just a quick note for panelists, please only turn on your cameras and microphones when you are answering a question. Please leave them off at all other times. So let's get started with a few facts and begin discussing what we do know about this topic of work and autism. We know that at least 85% of adults with autism are unemployed, which is the highest rate of unemployment across all disability populations, which also means that only 15% of adults with autism are employed within their communities. These numbers were last reported on in 2021 and had zero change onto their initial report in 2017. These numbers continue to be significantly higher than the current national unemployment rate, which is 3.5%. The highest the national unemployment rate has been in the past 20 years was 14.7% in April 2020, which of course was the very beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. Of those who are employed, they report working in these areas. 28% reporting working in building and grounds cleaning and maintenance, 18% in food prep and services, and 17% in retail being the top three areas of employment. This information came from the National Core Indicator Survey in 2014 to 2015, uh, saying that these were the most common jobs that individuals with autism held at that time. Two other studies from the US Department of Education, the first in yellow, a National Longitudinal Report from 2010, and the second, a report from Rehabilitation Services Administration in 2013 on the right in blue, reported these data. The majority of young adults in these studies reported working in office or administrative support positions at 19 or 26%. 
the second highest being food preparation and serving at 14 and 16 percent, and the third highest being sales jobs at 13 percent. The biggest difference here being the number one job being office or administrative jobs versus maintenance in the previous study, which was conducted in later in 2014. However, we do not know if the respondents in each of these studies were of the same or different populations within the autism spectrum, which we know is broad. And depending on the person, whether these jobs are meaningful to them or not. So what are those individuals doing who are not employed? This is what they report doing otherwise. In a, in a survey conducted in 2018 2019, families responded regarding the activities that their family member was taking part in. In the blue, these respondents were responding about an adult with autism who lived at home with their family. 83% of those individuals reported some type of daytime activity they were a part of, while 47% participated in some type of unpaid activity in their communities, possibly a day program or volunteering. 33% participated in some type of paid activity in the community or a facility, so anything from competitive employment to sheltered work. And 17% attended some type of schooling. Of those who lived outside of their family's home, 88% participated in some type of regular daytime activity outside of their home. 60% uh, participating in unpaid activities in their community or a facility, with 30% having some type of paid work in the community. Uh, 5% attended some type of school. All of these individuals received state supported DD services. And it was noted in the results of the study that the reason the numbers of community participation is lower for those who lived outside of their parents' homes was due to the higher rates of behavioral needs. So let's find out from some of our panelists what type of work they are engaged in. So we'll start with you, Tom. If you could turn on your camera and microphone. All right. Hi, Tom. Hey, Trina. Uh, I was wondering if you could tell us what type of work you've participated in so far. So for starters, I have worked on a farm and doing janitorial work when I was in high when I was in high school. Well, I have worked at Walmart collecting cards. I work after school at ShopRay as a cashier, and I used to work at AutoZone unloading merchandise. And at Alpine, I currently have internships at a library. Well, well, I used to at a library. I currently have, have internships at, at, at a pet care store a restaurant, bussing tables, as a cashier at a grocery store, completing, ma completing maintenance work at Crunch Fitness and at a medical company assembling test kits. Have... What? Go ahead. Sorry. My favorite is definitely Crunch Fitness since I really like enjoying, I really enjoy being in a workout environment. Okay, great. So you've had a, a variety of work experiences outside of Alpine. Yes. And even though you're employed in the evenings, you are continuing to sample various jobs uh, with support of the transition program. Yeah. That's great. Thank you so much, Tom, for sharing. Hey, no problem. And Gary, we could ask you a question. Sure. Um, what types of work experience do you arrange for students who attend internships at your business, Apple Spice? Well, we're a catering business, and right now we work with nine different learners from Alpine. Our goal is to give them some experience in food preparation, food service, and the entire culinary in industry. So we have people doing every possible thing that is needed. Um, it's our goal is to prepare them um, so that uh, they can provide lifelong employment opportunities. So we teach them everything from kitchen safety to um, uh, sanitary practices. Um, they learn knife skills. Um, they um, do um, build our boxes. They, they um, cook. Um, they make sandwiches. 
um, they really are um, doing everything that's necessary um, to, uh, to work in a food service environment. And uh, our goal is to not just have them do the cleaning and the routine stuff, but to really get their hands dirty and actually working in a kitchen. And it, it's interesting, they seem to enjoy the hands-on with the food um, the most. So um, we're excited by, uh, by what they do here. Yes. Our students really enjoy learning apple spice. The sandwiches are delicious, but even uh, hearing from you just now, you really provide a lot more than just work experience. You provide uh, life skills and you know social skills, and, and it's a, a great place for our students to be. And it's a it's a privilege to have them. Thank you. I've learned more from them than they've learned from me. Right, so we're going to move on to our next section uh, regarding barriers to employment. So for the 85% that are unemployed, the question is always why? Why when we know how hardworking and dedicated individuals with autism are as employees, do the unemployment rates for this group continue to be so high? A study by Coleman and Adams in 2018 in the state of Arizona <clears throat> investigated the reasons why this could be. Respondents were a variety of adults with autism as well as their family members of a person with autism. These respondents answered questions regarding what they felt the barriers to finding employment were. 172 people participated in the study and they found that only 40% were unemployed, which is much better than the national unemployment rate for individuals with autism. To summarize the data that you see here, the open answer categories show the challenges respondents reported as reasons for finding or keeping a job. While, while autism symptoms become the biggest response as to why individuals weren't finding employment, and we know many of the symptoms, especially social and communication difficulties could inhibit employment. We also have heard of employers desiring to hire individuals with autism because of some of the characteristics they have, such as focus or attention to detail, reliability. Needing work accommodations such as job coaching or even job training. This is where professionals and families come in the skills we provide learners with before they enter the adult world and once they enter the adult world is so important for their futures. Not only do we need to develop the skills our learners will need to succeed, but the availability of a good job coach is also needed. Problems getting past interviews, whether that is obtaining an interview or successfully getting through the interview once it is held. Or lack of support from DDD or VR agencies, Oftentimes, state service agencies are overwhelmed with high caseloads and many budget restrictions. The important part here will be the provider agencies that work with your learner and their performance or advocacy on behalf of the job seeker. And finally, the employer's lack of understanding of autism. Through our work in the community, talking with employers about our learners and showing them how best to support the individuals on their job, we are doing our part to educate the employers within our community. Our work through community-based work experiences and later on volunteer and paid positions is very important for the advocacy of each learner we are supporting. And with the report earlier noting that a barrier to finding employment was that the job seeker needs accommodations on the job, it is important that we are also discussing how to disclose with disability and the ways they need assistance on their job. Openly discussing the job seeker's disability with them and helping them to understand what assistance they may need on the job would be very helpful here. Providing time to role play, disclosing a disability or preparing a presentation on their skills, interests and needs would also be a support for the individual should they need to disclose for themselves. In our transition programs, we complete visual or video resumes prior to the learner's graduation in order to support them with presenting themselves to potential employers should that be needed. Now let's see what our panelists feel barriers to employment may be. Uh, Suzette, I have a question for you. Hi. Um, 
Hi, Katrina. Hi, everyone. As, as we are preparing Melanie for graduation, we are coming across a few things in the adult service world that could be a potential barrier for success for her, some of them which were on the screen previously. What would you say the potential largest barrier would be as you're, as you're facing her future as an adult? So I think at the moment, I think our biggest challenge um, is creating an adult life for Melanie that is going to fit within our budget. Our plan after Melanie graduates is for her to spend her days at different work sites and then participate in some leisure activities, some self-care and independent daily living skills in the afternoons. And the logistics of this can make make it a little bit tricky. So, you know, as an example, Melanie was offered employment um, from one of her current work locations. And um, they offered her employment from three to seven, three days a week. So three in the afternoon to 7 p.m., which is amazing. And we're so grateful for the opportunity. The difficulty comes when mom and dad have to leave for work at eight o'clock in the morning. And now we have to think about, okay, well, who's gonna stay with Melanie from eight till three? And the truth is, is that if we have to hire somebody to stay with Melanie from eight to three, we are gonna wipe out her budget. Um, and we haven't even yet considered transportation or um, supported employment at her locations. So um, it's gonna require a little creativity and we're gonna have to try and figure it out so that we have the right opportunities for her that are both appropriate and can work within her budget. It's important to think of all of those areas and how much that uh, support can, uh, support from the budget or from the state services, how much that can uh, help to succeed, uh, as well as potentially have some barriers to success in the future and how you work around that. It's very different going from the school, uh, school funding to the ad adult funding. It's a, a very different way of life. It is. Thank you, Suzette. Uh, Kathleen. Hi, Kathleen. Hi there. Hi, everyone. Uh, Tom, so Tom has had a variety of work experiences, you know, before coming to Alpine, while he's coming, uh, while he's been here with us. What have you seen as barriers to successful employment for Tom over the years that he's been working? Um, okay, um, some of the barriers, I, mean, I have three that I think have been most impactful uh, to him. And the first one would be not knowing where to start or what to imagine or how to, iman how to imagine a position. Um, so, there are, all, there are a lot of job openings out there, but it has been difficult for T to imagine himself working in a particular position. Um, so I would ask him if he wanted to do something or um, he might see something, but then since he couldn't imagine it and he, you know, he had a certain idea of what he wanted to do, he wasn't interested in trying it. Um, if it didn't sound good to him, if I would, you know, go over certain aspects of the position, um, he would say, no, he wasn't interested in giving it a try. So that would be the first barrier. Uh, the second barrier I thought um, would be that he, I, I think that he has been having trouble occasionally with um, the first interview, getting past the first interview. Um, and, you know, we all struggle with job interviews. It's, it's a common thing. But I think that because um, Thomas gives very short answers or he may not be able to or sense that the interviewer wants him to elaborate further on a question that you know, they're asking him, uh, that may be troublesome with the interviewer. So if he's just saying yes, no, you know, they may not be able to find out more about him. Um, he's, been in, he's been working on interview skills with the program now. So I think that's been helping him. Um, he was able to uh, find a position with ShopRite and um, 
that's while he has been in your program. So I think that that has been helpful. And the last item I think would be management itself. So Thomas has been doing better in positions um, where the manager is very helpful and has been accepting of an employee who may need some additional guidance. Um, twice he's had an experience where he's had a very helpful manager and then the manager has left the company and that has affected Thomas's performance in the position and he ultimately didn't want to stay there. So he would leave the position. Um, so I think management buy-in is very important um, and perhaps even having a mentor on site would be important for him. Oh, that's great. And then touching again on, on the barriers that that these studies have reported as well across the board of that the the essential piece of practicing those interview skills and social skills, uh, educating employers and making sure that they're aware of autism and the sports the, the supports that somebody with autism may need on the job. So thank you, Kathleen. Now, Tom, I would like to go to you. Tom, are you there? Yeah, we're here. here. Sorry, it won't just start the video. There we go. Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, so, Tom, I wanted to ask, in your opinion as well, so some of your jobs have been successful. You know, you've been there for a long time and happy with them, while others didn't end up lasting long term. What do you think made the difference for a job that you were happy in and stayed versus one that you left after a shorter period of time? All right. For starters, I'm happy working at Crunch Fitness because I'm into fitness and I like cleaning the machines. I was not happy at the farm or Walmart because of the environment. Sometimes it would rain while I was working outside gathering cards. I did not like the job tasks I was assigned at the farm. It was important for me to it, it is important for me that I'm interested in the work I do and that I am comfortable in the environment. I appreciate a supportive environment too because then my coworkers also help me to grow as an employee and to be a better person. Right. And, and I think that that's, those are all part of learning what we want to do for work. And, and as uh, your mother mentioned earlier, envisioning yourself in these jobs and trying new jobs. So you came to Alpine with a lot of experience and you have you've gone out and tried other things even since you've been here. And um, it's nice to see that growth. And uh, would you say you feel more comfortable trying new things now that you've had a variety of experiences? Yes, I would say that. That's great. Thank you so much, Tom. Hey, no problem. So how do we address these barriers and prepare for the future? First, we, we know there are a large number of individuals who transition into adulthood each year. Uh, 50,000 currently to be exact, and the numbers are estimated to rise over the next few years. In general, parents and professionals do report not being happy with the transition process. And Anderson et al. did also report that in 2018, only 58% of students who needed a transition plan actually had one in place when it was required, which is by the age of 14. It has been noted that one purpose of special education is also to prepare students for employment after high school which is why uh, we at Alpine really focus on those employment experiences while students are with us uh, so that they can try out different work experiences and hopefully they leave here with employment. So it makes sense that these stats are also true. Only 40% of people who did not have work experience in their high school years found employment soon after graduation and soon being within two years after they graduate. While 90% of individuals who did have work during their high school years found employment soon after graduation. It's a pretty big difference. 
And very important to note when we are discussing preparing for meaningful employment in adulthood. In the Coleman and Adams study we discussed earlier, respondents also gave their opinion on what is needed most to help individuals with autism to find and keep a job. The respondents mentioned a way to counter the challenges to finding a job as mentioned previously, but then also added transportation, which uh, Suzette mentioned for us earlier, as something that is needed to help keep a job. Depending on the family or individual learner, transportation concerns can be different for each person, whether it's teaching them to use Uber, or paratransit, the public bus, or if it's working around a parent's schedule, this will be a process that we need to address individually. It will also depend on the resources available near their home, uh, what type of town you live in, uh, or if county paratransit does not travel in your neighborhood. And of course, our panelists have experience in preparation for employment. So let's ask them what they are doing. Uh, Gary, if I could ask you a question. Sure. Oh, there you go. Uh, a big part of how we prepare our students, as I've mentioned, is that we provide them with a variety of work experiences. And uh, they sample those experiences, see what they enjoy, where their skills are. And as an employer partner, you are a huge part of that for us and for nine students to be exact, as you mentioned. Um, what are you doing to ensure that our students have the most meaningful experience to help them prepare for their future employment, whether that's with Apple Spice or whether it's with another organization. I think the most important thing, and it was it was talked about earlier, is one of the challenges that um, the students face is making sure that they feel like they're supported, giving them the attention, sometimes individually, um, sometimes collectively and working with them as a group. Also making sure that um, we give them um, job assignments um, that are geared to what, number one, that they're strong at, and number two, making sure that those things that they enjoy, they do the most of. But at the same time, it's equally important that they learn in the job environment that um, sometimes you do have to do things that you know, aren't your favorite. And it's an important thing to learn. It's no different than all of us. Sometimes you are given in the workplace things that you would rather not do. You have to learn that you don't get um, always to pick and choose. So I try and find a balance um, towards fulfilling what they want and testing them and giving them opportunities or um, quite frankly, requiring them to do some things that they would rather not. I very much pay attention to each individual need. Um, I don't think of myself as an employer. I think of myself as a mentor and a coach and a learner as well. Um, there can be no arrogance. Um, uh, they, they need to learn that there are different types of managers they're gonna work with and um, they're not gonna love them all because that is gonna be the reality of what they face once they get into the workplace. Um, it's important that they get immediate feedback um, when they're doing something um, right, but also that when they're doing something incorrectly, um, that they're told that. There can't be a, a reluctance um, to say, mm, you know, you just have to do it in the right way. And we're very careful that where there's um, um, not ideal practices, that they are corrected and that we then follow up to make sure that the behaviors or the actions have changed based on the feedback. So I spend a lot of time individually with each one, giving them the feedback, giving them encouragement, um, but also making sure that they're learning the importance of doing things, not just doing things, but doing things the right way. Because that is gonna be the reality um, when they're working in any kind of paid environment, the employer is going to expect them to do it correctly. Exactly, building those hard skills uh, is, is super important, especially if they aspire to go into food service. 
but also, as you mentioned, those essential skills of being able to uh, work with others, your coworkers, your supervisor, and being accommodating uh, and accepting feedback is very important for anybody's success on the job and something that they can generalize and transfer to any other place that they would work. Um, and, and we truly appreciate that you're always pushing our students to do the next thing. Um, oftentimes, Gary says to us, you know, I, I think that Mel could be doing this. Let's try her on that. And uh, she's doing a completely different task than when she first started working there. So it's, it's always nice to see growth and partnership. I do, I do think variety of assignments is important as well. No different than anybody else. Doing the same thing uh, over and over, it becomes redundant. Um, it, it takes away motivation. So we do try and make sure that we're switching up assignments so that everybody kind of gets an opportunity to do everything while never putting anybody in an unsafe situation. Thank you so much. Uh, Tom, I, I have another question for you. Yes. So our last slide did mention job coaching as a way to help prepare students for success in a job. And you mentioned having coaches uh, previously. You've had experiences at workplaces with and without a job coach. Um, has a job coach been helpful to you and uh, how so? Yes, I think having a job coach is very helpful. I learned how to focus more on tasks better and improve my relationships with coworkers and supervisors. In some places, I haven't had a job coach, and it made learning the job a, a lot harder, and it took me longer to understand my job and to get to know my coworkers, too. And, and it took me longer to get along with my coworkers. Yeah, that's just about it. Yeah, so it sounds like you would you prefer having the support uh, and mentorship of a good job coach on the job. Yes. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to hear that it's been helpful for you and, and that you've learned a variety of skills with their support. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Tom. You're no and uh, finally for Susan and Kathleen. Uh, both of your children have experienced many work experiences throughout their careers so far. And uh, what have you felt prepared them the most for their future careers? Uh, Suzette, if, if we could start with you. Sure. Um, I think in preparing um, Melanie for um, employment, I think there's there's two things that you that she really needs to have in order to be successful. And I would say the first one is is etiquette. Um, and I think that you know Melanie's programming from the very start um, has included this. everything from personal hygiene and grooming. She was taught to choose appropriate clothing, um, to always using good manners and to, I mean, even moving from one room to another without vocalizing. Um, she was taught to shake someone's hand, to introduce herself. Um, and I think that these skills that she has now enable her to blend into the workplace without being a distraction. Um, I think that, you know, you can have a great skill set and you can be a very, very capable worker, but if you can't sit in the lunchroom um, and behave appropriately, I think it's it's probably not going to work out. Um, and I think the second piece of it, obviously, is the skill set. Um, you know, Alpine has partnered with incredible organizations, and they've worked together to ensure that Melanie and Tom and our other learners acquire the skills that they need to be a part of the workplace and. In my opinion, having corporate partners that understand our mission and take the time to invest in our learners is the key and success to meaningful employment. And we are, we've been very fortunate to have that. Thank you, Suzette. Uh, Kathleen, would you have anything to add on 
Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, I don't think it is like one job that has prepared him, but I think it's the whole experience of all of his internships right now um, that is really preparing him for future employment. Number one, um, when he first came into the program, he was very, very, I would say closed off to trying any of the internships. And he, you know, he just didn't think that was for him. Um, with a little time and a little reinsur reassurance, he agreed to start participating in the internships. Um, he signed up for four. He like he he dropped one. He took up another, and now he even has another one on top of that. And um, it's really really exciting for me to know that he's working in different locations. He's doing um, various very varied responsibilities and tasks in these positions. And he's, what's really, really exciting, and it's what Gary was going, talking about, he's reporting to different people at each location. And so he's learning how to interact with his managers in a professional way. And he's also learning how to, um, how to integrate with his other coworkers, in a professional way. Um, he's also learning how to meet his manager's expectations um, uh, and, and dealing with work relationships as opposed to personal relationships. So these are all like key things are really like soft skills, but they're really, really important in the work environment. Um, I think that this experience will put him ahead of many of his peers um, with autism and without autism, because you know he's learning how to deal with so many different people and personalities. And um, it's great. It, it, it may not be easy, but it's great. Um, so I wanted to say shout out to Katrina, Nicole, and Marie um, for nudging him along in this process and, and helping him feel secure in doing it. and. Um, it's been great. It's been a great experience. Thank you, Kathleen. And and I would agree. It's been great to see you, Tom. Uh, you know, exploring these different opportunities that we're we're arranging, and also really assessing them as he's there and saying, "I like this environment. This is someplace I can see myself working," um, or maybe this is not for me. And you know, really evaluating each of those areas with us. I think that will be nice. Uh, a nice addition for his future planning. So thank you, Kathleen. So meaningful work will be the result of successful person-centered planning and a multitude of experiences with various support people in the person's life, such as families, staff, teachers, and community members, as well as the participation in quality adult and transition services. In an article published in 2023, uh, Berg and colleagues gathered advice from caregivers to service providers about improving the quality of services to adolescents and young adults with autism by focusing on the relationships that they are building. They identified four areas, including educating others on autism, improving access to services, addressing gaps in services, and building a roadmap to services. The section in green identified gaps in services which led to employment. These areas included building out specific services to include social skills and socialization, transition skills, life skills, crisis intervention, and identifying employment goals. These are all areas that we program for within our transition programs here at Alpine, but continue on as a focus through adulthood as well as these skills within these areas may be forever changing depending on life circumstances. Identifying meaningful employment is a process that takes time and it's important to start early. Transition age in the school system officially begins at the age of 14, but it doesn't need to start there. A lot can be done at home. Think of thinking about the chores that you assign to your child starting at a young age, um, building responsibility within your home, work can be done in the community. 
uh, starting to volunteer at a pet shelter or a senior center. Some will allow volunteers as young as 12, while most will consider youth at 15 or 16. Not only will these experiences build specific skills for employment, but they will also increase social opportunities and in some cases, life skills as well. In many ways, the search to build meaningful employment opportunities is a byproduct of attempts to build a meaningful life, which makes sense since work is such an important part of our adult lives. After all, 80% of our lives are spent as adults. Let's make it meaningful. So in summary, as we're preparing for meaningful employment, we do the following. We explore work opportunities. We assist in identifying skills, interests, and needs from those experienced by gathering feedback on preferences, exploring those further if needed, and identifying what supports and financial needs will, be, will need to be considered, such as a job coach, social security funds, et cetera. We advocate by educating others and sharing our experiences. And if we've done everything along this path, we will hopefully end with meaningful employment opportunities for the individuals that we support. <clears throat> and while this graphic here looks pretty straightforward, we all know that this path will look very different for each of us as we each have different interests and skills. What is meaningful to me may not be meaningful to you, et cetera. So I'd like to end this conversation today with one final question from our panelists. And that question being, what does meaningful employment look like to you? So let's start with, uh, with Tom. All right. What meaningful employment? Meaningful employment looks like me enjoying my job and working with the coworkers and supervisors in a fair work environment, where I also feel respected, feel like a person. It would also be great to earn enough money that would allow me to reach my goal of living on my own. Thank you, Tom. That that does sound meaningful. Yeah. Uh, Suzette. So, sorry. So for me, um, meaningful employment includes a two-way transfer of value. To start, the employer needs to receive a benefit from my child being in, sorry here. Um, my child needs to, the employer needs to be, receive a benefit from Melanie being there. And I guess a simple test is that, you know, if Melanie can't show up for work one day, does somebody else need to step in and do what she was supposed to do? And I think if the answer is yes, then she's adding value. I think there are other ways that employers can receive value from our learners being in the workplace. Um, you know, in speaking to one of our past employers, he reported that his corporate morale, like the morale of the employees that he had on staff improved when our learners were on site and they made them feel good to be helping and supporting um, our adult children. So I think that's also um, a way that the employers can receive value. And at the same time, um, our learners need to receive value. And obviously the obvious one, okay, there's monetary compensation, that's obvious, but there's also the benefit of learning a new skill and you know, tucking that skill into your toolbox so that when you move on to another job site, you're able to um, you know, use, use that skill in, in, in a different setting. And I think probably the most significant um, are the intangibles. And you know, when our kids go to work sites, I think they have a sense of self-worth. I think they gain confidence. I think they feel validated and I think they feel included. And I think that, you know, while it's difficult to quantify that, I think it's probably the most valuable. Thank you, Suzette. <clears throat> uh, Kathleen.
Yes. What does what does meaningful employment look like to you? Um, well, Thomas is seeking a career, and um, so it's going to be it's going to be, I think, tricky, but um, very fulfilling. I think that um, what he needs is like the whole package of great management. He has to be interested in the position. He needs to have job satisfaction. Um, he need, he's looking for very good pay or good pay. Um, he's, I, I want him to be able to grow in the position. So, um, cause I'm also looking for a career for him. I, I want him to start some in, in a spot and be able to grow with that. And I want him to have some pride in what he's doing. Um, that, that goes along with the interest piece. So he's going to be interested in doing it and he's going to feel very good about doing whatever job he lands in. Um, I think basically I want something for him that offers him a future and the ability to take care of himself. That doesn't take me out of the equation at all, but I think that he wants that that's what he wants. And so I want to facilitate that as much as possible. Great. Thank you, Kathleen. Uh, and last but not least, Gary. I think so much of um, the question has been addressed by um, the parents and by Tom directly. Um, for me, it is it is no more different than it is for anybody else. Um, it's giving them a self sense of self worth, of adding value to uh, to an employer's um, needs. It is about enjoying your job. It is about waking up on days when you go to work and saying, I'm excited. I look forward to going to work. It's about having a sense of pride in what you what you do. Um, all things being, obviously it would be nice um, to make a good living, um, but it, I honestly don't think meaningful employment for um, our learners is any different than meaning empo meaningful employment for any of us. It is, it is really giving us an opportunity to, um, to own something and to feel as if um, when we get up in the morning, um, we're going to do something important. We're going to do something that's not only meaningful to us, but meaningful to our employer. I love the idea. Um, I think Suzette said it about does the um, employer um, what happens when they don't show up for work? Does the employer feel their absence? Um, I know I do, although I can say in, in over two years, I don't think I've had anybody not show up. Every one of Alpine's uh, um, students have show such reliability, but I, 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 I just don't think there's all that much difference in what they are looking for than what my children are looking for um or any of us thank you gary very well said as as we heard from the panelists meaningful employment same adding value to the employer but also adding a value to the individual's life and meaning something slightly different to each person as it would for anybody else so thank you very much panelists and uh, for your time today. I've truly enjoyed this conversation with you all and I hope those of you attending have enjoyed it as well. Um, we'd like to now turn it over to Jamie and over to you all if you have any questions for us. Nina, and thank you to all our panel members for uh, providing that information on, on a, a very uh, informative topic and a, a very um, well needed topic. Uh, we do have a few questions that came in uh, during the presentation. Um, so uh, I'd like to address them to you, Katrina. Um, I'm going to paraphrase and summarize. Um, one question came in about uh, the role of um, DVR. And if you perhaps, Katrina, could elaborate on what the role is uh, in the process of finding employment and supporting um, uh, individuals who need that support uh, with interviews and and have they in the past been willing to collaborate with Alpine or, or organizations like Alpine? Mm -hmm. That makes sense? Yes, 
Yeah, so with a uh, DVR, uh, any person with a disability can apply for their services and they will provide services uh, towards finding employment, uh, preparing, I'm pretty sure their job coaches do interview practice and job searches with them. Um, they would then provide support on a job once that's found. Uh, they do provide other services like supporting education, um, you know, looking for evaluations. There are a number of services that they can provide depending on what the individual needs. Um, they are a shorter term support. Uh, so once you have the job, it's about 90 days that they would provide that support and then you would transition to the state DV services. Um, we have worked briefly here and there with DVR for some of those individuals who did not need longer term supports. Uh, but we mostly work with the state uh, DVD services as our individuals will need longer term supports from us. Okay, great, thank you. The next question is more about skill acquisition. Um, a parent is concerned that um, their child does not really understand when it is a good time to give out personal information. For example, social security um, number, um, or even how much personal information to give out. So when and how much. Um, do you have any advice on perhaps what how that might be taught? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so this is, uh, is a social skill and that's something for students within our uh, within our programs, we would work on this separately to understand the understand the potential, dangers of sharing personal information. And we would want to role play that with them and role play that with them within our programs in the community uh, so that they understand and can really practice that these are times when we don't share information and these are times when we do. Um, and so having a good uh, support team to really work on that and generalize that skill to uh, home, community, and their eventual workplace would be really important and, and how we would address that. Great, thank you. That's a great tip, role-playing. Mm -hmm. um, two more questions. I think we have a few more minutes. I think we can get to both of these. Um, you all spoke about meaningful employment and the question came in about, you know, is there are certainly some jobs that aren't meaningful that are, you know, social security often says that someone can do a simple unskilled job. Um, so the question is, if it's too tedious, will it perhaps backfire um, and, and cause maybe job refusal? So I guess maybe this parent is wondering about, is there any evidence relating to, um, do, do jobs have to be meaningful? And if they aren't, is there some kind of harm that could result? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I haven't seen anything specifically relating to harm, but more so the success of well-matched uh, positions. And so really spending the time uh, to get to know somebody and where their interests, their skills, and their needs are to set them up with a well-matched position. I think overall, if we were to really look into the research and the statistics, we would probably see that there would be uh, you know, shorter term um, retention for employment that is not meaningful. And that would be a harm to an employer because they're losing employees, but also um, a lack of success within the workforce might be frustrating for somebody too. So I think it's very important that we spend that time to really explore uh, it, it, all of the possibilities and to determine what is the best for that person. Great, thank you, Katrina. Um, another question on um, who pays for job coaches? Does DVR only get involved if a school has a transition plan in place? So we don't work with DVR directly within our transition programs because we have support from the Department of Education. Um, there are other agencies that may be a contracted a service provider of DVR that would then um, pay a job coach to provide those supports um, depends on if they've graduated from school. There's a lot to unload with that question, um, but DVR would provide job coaching where needed as long as they have a caseload open with DVR. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, a question came in about um, young adult learners who are nonverbal and how might the interview process uh, proceed or what might that look like? So the way we would do that is that we build the relationship with the employer and share information with permission, obviously, uh, from the individual or their guardian that we can share that information and we do visual uh, presentations, a, a visual resume or a video resume that we would share with them so that the employer knows the person even prior to them meeting them. So that once they do meet that person, they know what to expect, they understand how to communicate with them, whether they're using a communication device uh, or another means of communication. And uh, that first meeting is a success. So we provide the advocacy ahead of time. Um, I've worked with people who have come in and press play on their video resume to present themselves. And it's, it's been a very positive meeting. So that advocacy up front and knowing what to expect on the employer's end is very important. Yeah, that's a great. Another helpful tip is the video resume. Excellent. Mm -hmm. And I think we have time for one more question. Um, and it's about building relationship, relationships in the community. And how do you go about doing that? Is it just cold calling? Is it through families that, that are affiliated with Alpine? How, how do you go about doing that? Uh, short answer is all of the above. <laughs> uh, we are looking at the needs of the individuals that are within our programs and seeing what they're interested in and then searching for the employers that would, could be a good match. And so we might be cold calling them. Um, we also have a jobs committee here that we've started amongst Alpine that includes our families, uh, some board members, staff, uh, that they're all on there and we're sharing our network. And so sometimes those come out of that committee that you know we need a, um, a pizza shop to work at and somebody knows the owner of such a pizza shop. And so then we're getting that connection and that introduction. And then we go in and talk about our program and the supports that we provide. So it comes from many avenues and that really important piece is building that relationship. Great, thank you so much, Katrina. Um, and we're going to end here for now today. Thank you for being here to all of our panelists uh, and to you, Katrina, all of our attendees. As a reminder, uh, this webinar is one in a series of free webinars that we are conducting throughout the month of April. All webinars are recorded, and you can feel free to scan this QR code to learn more about the other webinars in this series. If you or someone you know is looking for autism services, please reach out to Alpine Learning Group. Our intake coordinator is happy to help you navigate next steps. When the webinar ends, you'll receive a survey and we appreciate your feedback so that we can continue to provide information that's of value to you and your family and to the community. Thank you all again for being here. Thank you to our panel members. And we are going to end for today. Thanks. Goodbye. Thank you.